video we're discussing randomized block design experiments and um, we're going to use a classic example you find in a lot of textbooks. So it's a good example though to illustrate the idea so hopefully it will help make it clear. Um, so let's talk about the uh, basic idea of this experiment and then we'll discuss why the randomized block design seems to be the most appropriate choice. So the idea is that we have four brands of golf balls brand A, B, C, D, right? So four different brands, and maybe they all claim to be the best golf balls on the planet. They all travel the farthest according to their advertising, and we want to figure out if that's true. So we might think about how could we do that. Well, if we use the completely randomized design, the CRD experiment that we had before, completely randomized design, the CRD, in that sort of scenario, what we did is we sort of laid out the treatments, right? We had treatment A, B, C, D. The treatment here would be the golf balls, right? They're the things that we're going to test to see if they work. And then we'd sort of apply, you know, experimental units to that. In this case, we might apply golfers to it. We might have golfers, you know, stand there and, you know, just, you know, we'll get 40 golfers, let's say, or 50 golfers, and we'll randomly apply them to um, each group, right? Let's take just for simple numbers, let's say we have 20 golfers, and we're going to decide that we're going to put five golfers. They might have, you know, Golfer one here, you know, we'll apply golfer two here, golfer three here, you know, golfer four here, golfer five, golfer six, golfer seven, golfer eight, you know, so on and so forth. And we'll do this over and over until we end up having in each group, you know, five different golfers. And then those five golfers will all strike the ball and we'll measure the distances the balls travel, and then we'll come out with totals. You know, we'll have the total distances traveled, and from there we can get mean differences. And we can run the um, CRD ANOVA procedure and see if there's a meaningful difference between the flights achieved by each golf ball. That may seem like a perfectly legitimate design. Let's analyze it a little further, though, and see about uh, what possible problem might come up. I mean, it seems perfectly fine, except for what if, what if A, because you know, these golfers are not going to be all the same ability level, right? I mean, it's, it's impossible really to find that. I mean, if you went to, the, you, know, you got PGA professionals, you know, professional golfers. I mean, you certainly can't guarantee that they have the same ability of striking the ball, right? They all drive the balls different distances, and some are better at it than others. So there's no way we can make sure that they all hit the ball the same way. So you know, certainly we can't guarantee that these golfers have equal abilities. What if by randomizing the way we've done it, what if we just happen to just get, unluckily, a bunch of people in this first column here who are not very good at striking the ball? That means that A's performance, the golf ball's performance, is going to suffer because these golfers are poor golfers. So not because A is a bad golf ball, but because these golfers are weak, A is not going to do as well in this procedure. We might come up with you know, results that, uh, you know, are sort of biased in that way. Now you may say, well, gee, that can happen lots of times in a completely randomized design experiment, you know. We hope that the randomization here prevents that, right? We hope that, you know, we don't have all the bad golfers in one column. So, yeah, you can make that argument, but if there's a way to strip away the golfers' um, differences, wouldn't that be a better approach? I think it would be, right? So that's kind of what the randomized block design allows us to do. If we look at the completely randomized design, the way it handles this procedure is it basically takes the, um, the variation that you see in those outcomes. And what do I mean by variations? Well, what, what, what would we record for each of those columns? We would record the distances traveled by the golf balls, right? How far the golf balls went. And those numbers would be different. They wouldn't all be the same. That variation, those differences, is basically what we try to explain using the completely randomized design breakdown. We try to explain it by splitting it into two categories. We basically say, look, the differences we see in those distances achieved by the golf balls, they're due to the type of golf balls, right? Golf ball type, you can say. This is generically called the treatment, right? Generically, we call that the treatment. But that's the golf ball type, you know, type A, B, C, or D. So that's one reason why the balls travel different distances, because the balls are different, right? The type of construction of them is different. And then all the other stuff is put into the error term, the experimental error term. This is essentially everything we don't know or care about, right? So, you know, maybe it's the golfers, for example. Maybe they make a difference, and so that's why there's going to be differences. Maybe it's the weather outside, the wind, the driver they use to swing, um, the gloves they're wearing. There could be countless different things that could affect um, the flight of the ball, right? 
the wind as they struck the ball. Maybe the wind picked up or something affected it, right? So either way, there's lots of things that could cause differences in the flights of the balls, but anything that's not a golf ball, we throw into error. So, you know, the type of golf ball is the treatment, everything else gets thrown into error, that's a completely randomized design. And, you know, then we're going to make a comparison. We're going to see, like, you know, when we isolate the treatment effect and compare it to the error, we want to see if this effect is relatively large against this effect. Well, think about it. If you put too much stuff in the air, right, like the differences between the golfers, you're going to have a hard time being able to show the golf balls are different. Like, aren't these four golf balls going to generally probably travel pretty much almost the same distances? We might be able to detect small differences between them and say, yes, one of them is truly better consistently. But those differences probably are not going to be huge. They probably won't be as large as the differences between the golfers themselves it is all going to be thrown into this error term under the completely randomized design experiment. So in that situation, we're probably going to have a very hard time showing that these balls are different at all from one another. However, if we could ignore the golfer's differences, we could strip it away from this error term, so that when we compare the error to the treatment effect, we're not including all that, those differences between the golfers. If we could do that, then we should get a better result. And that's essentially what we do in the randomized block design. So when we switch over from completely randomized design, to the randomized block design, what we're able to do using that procedure is to take this error term and split it up one more time. So we'll take that and say, let's break that down into two things. In this case, we'd say maybe the golfers, right? The golfers, which we'll call generically as the blocks. So just like we call the balls the treatments, we're going to call the golfers the blocks. And then all the leftover stuff, the error, right? So that's basically what we do. We end up having three components to the model. Then we have the random error, the experimental error, right? We have the treatment, and we have the blocks. So now, essentially, we'll, by isolating that, and we can, you know, we could run a test to show that the blocks are different from one another if we wanted, I guess. But you know, we're not really interested in the golfers. We're just interested in the balls. By doing this, we separate that effect out, and this is a more pure error. It just only has the other stuff that we're not worried about, like for example the weather, the wind, the temperature, et cetera, right? Those factors are going to be in the error term. The ball will be here, and then the golfer is here. But by splitting it apart, when we make the comparison between these two, we're going to have a better chance at showing that, hey, the balls really are different because we've taken away a lot of the error, which we, we know is there and we don't care about, right? We know golfers have different abilities. We don't care about that. We don't want to throw that into the error because it's going to make it hard for us to detect differences between the balls themselves. So we've got to find a way to strip away the golfer's effect. How do they do that? It's really simple, actually. You would set up the design something like this. You would take five golfers, let's say. You, know, you can use more depending on how many times you want to strike the ball. But either way, we're going to have five golfers in my example. And then I randomly assign the golf balls to each golfer. Notice how these are randomized in here, right? So they're not always hitting ball A first, right? Sometimes they hit it first, second, sometimes last, etc., right? So they're randomized among the five golfers, the position in which they hit, but each golfer strikes each ball exactly once. And as a result of that, we get a measurement for each of them for each golfer. And then essentially what we do is we just try to see basically is it consistent that, say, golfer one and golfer two and golfer three and golfer four and golfer five, for example, do they all hit A the farthest, let's say, for example? But even though they may hit the ball very different distances, one guy may hit it 500 yards, the other guy may only hit it 300 yards, but the question is, is A the best for each individual golfer? If it is, then we'd say, hey, A is the best golf ball for all golfers, right? All right. The last thing I want to say about this, you know, because of course the, the problems get into the details, right? When we do the problem videos, we'll be able to work out the problem, see how that's done, all the mechanics are there. But just as far as the rest of the, this video is just introducing the concept and kind of giving you the theory, um, one thing I want to mention is there's a very important thing that we have to assume here when we do, we don't do the randomized block design experiment the way we're doing it here, and that is we want to assume that there's no interaction effect. What that means essentially is that we don't want a scenario where, you know, maybe golf ball A is the best golf ball for golfer one, but if you give it to golfer two, all of a sudden A is the worst golf ball. You know, we want to see that there's a consistent pattern. So if you graphed it, and we do these graphs actually to test for this assumption, and the graph is called an interaction effect graph. So basically you have this kind of scenario. What you want to see is that for, you know, let's say we have 
golf ball A, B, C, and D, right? These are the golf balls. If you want to see that for golfer one, maybe we have something like this, you know? You might have a graph that looks like this. So maybe this is what happens for golfer one. This is the, the distances, right? The flight distances of the ball. Of course, you can see that golf ball, golfer one hit golf ball A this far, hit golf ball B this far, C this far, D this far. If we wanted to plot golfer two on there, we got another marker so you can see this. We do golfer two, so this is golfer one in black. We do golfer two in green. If we want to see golfer two, what we want to see is something like this. Maybe it's like this, the pattern. So what you're seeing here in the drawing is that golfer two is a better golfer. He can hit the ball farther, right? He hits all the balls farther. But what you see is that when he hits A, you know, he hits it far, but not as far as he hits B. And C doesn't go as far as A and B, and B is his worst, right? And that's the pattern we also saw with golfer one, right? So for golfer one and two, we see that kind of parallel track, right? What we don't want to see happen is something like this. Let me grab another marker here. So we don't want to see something like this, say golfer five comes along, and he hits the ball, and we end up having, you know, for A, he's up here, for B is down here, for C is over here, and D is over here. You don't want to see this happen. Because what that means is that there's some interaction. Generally, B is the best ball, unless you give it to golf for five, then suddenly it's the worst ball. We don't want to see that happen. If that happens, then we're not meeting the assumptions for a randomized block design. That assumption is that there isn't an interaction effect. That essentially, in theory, if golf ball B is the best ball for for in the list, then it's the best for all golfers that we give it to, right? Every golfer that comes along and strikes B is gonna hit it farthest. You know, you may be a poor golfer, you may hit the balls like this, you know. You may hit way down here because you're not very good, but still, B is your best ball, D is your worst, so on and so forth. So that's kind of the assumption that we have in randomized block design. So you have to make sure that that's met. And that's usually done with these drawings. A lot of times in your class, you'll just be told to assume that you don't have to worry about it.